professional criminals professional criminals make a significant portion of their income from crime professionals do not delude themselves with the belief that their acts are impulsive one time efforts nor do they employ elaborate rationalizations to excuse the harmfulness of their actions shoplifting does not really hurt anyone <clears throat> consequently professionals pursue their craft with vigor attempting to learn from older experienced criminals the techniques that will earn them the most money with the least risk though their numbers are relatively small professionals engage in crimes that produce the greater losses to society and perhaps cause the more significant social harm professional theft traditionally refers to non-violent forms of criminal behavior that are undertaken with a high degree of skill for monetary gain and that exploit interests tending to maximize financial opportunities and minimize the possibilities of apprehension the most typical forms include pocket picking burglary shoplifting forgery and counterfeiting extortion sneak theft and confidence swindling relatively little is known about the career patterns of professional thieves and criminals from the literature on crime and delinquency three patterns emerge youths come under the influence of older experienced criminals who teach them the trade juvenile gang members continue their illegal activities at a time when most of their peers have dropped out to marry raise families and take conventional jobs youth sent to prison for minor offenses learn the techniques of crime from more experienced thieves for example harry king a professional thief relates this story about his entry into the crime after being placed in a shelter care home by his recently divorced mother <clears throat> it was while i was at this parental school that i learned that some of the kids had been committed there by the court for stealing bikes they taught me how to steal and where to steal them and where to sell them incidentally some of the nicer people were the ones who bought bikes from the kids they would dismantle the bike and use the parts the wheels chains handlebars and so forth there is some debate in the criminological literature over who may be defined as a professional criminal some criminologists such as advin suderland use the term to refer only to thieves who do not use force or physical violence in their crimes and live solely by their wits and skill however 
some criminologists use the term to refer to any criminal who identifies with a criminal subculture who makes the bulk of his or her living from crime and who possesses a degree of skill in his or her chosen trade thus one can become a professional safe cracker burglar car thief or fence some criminologists would not consider drug addicts who steal to support their habit as professionals they lack skill and therefore are amateur opportunists rather than professional technicians however professional criminals who take drugs might still be considered under the general pattern of professional crime if the sole criteria for being judged a professional criminal is using crime as one's primary source of income then many drug users would have to be placed in the professional category Sutherland's professional criminal What we know about the lives of professional criminals has come to us through their general diaries and autobiographies or the first person accounts they have given to criminologists. The best known account of professional theft is Edwin Sutherland's recording of the life of a professional thief or con man. Chick Conwell in Sutherland's classic book The Professional Thief. Conwell and Sutherland's concept of professional thief has two critical dimensions. First, professional thieves engage in limited types of crime. They can be described by the following labels: pick pocket canon a sneak thief from stores banks and offices heel shoplifter booster jewel thief who substitutes fake gems for real ones penny waiter thief who steals from hotel rooms hotel brawl confidence game artist thief in rackets related to confidence games forger extortionist from those engaging in illegal acts shake down artist <coughs> professionals depend solely on their wit and skill thieves who use force or commit crimes that require little expertise are not considered worthy by the worthy of the little professional worthy of the title professional their areas of activity include such heavy rackets as bank robbery car theft burglary and safe cracking You can see that Conwell and Sutherland's criteria for professionalism are weighted heavily toward con games and trickery and give little attention to common street crimes. The second requirement to establish professionalism as a thief is the exclusive use of wits, front, a believable demeanor and talking ability. Manual dexterity and physical force are of little importance. Moreover, professional thieves must acquire status in their profession. The status is based on their technical skill, financial standing, connectionism, power, dress, mannerism, and wide knowledge. In their world, thief is a little worn with thief is a title worn with pride
Conwell and Sutherland also argue that professional thieves share feelings, sentiments and behaviors. Of these, none is more important than the code of honor of the underworld. Even under threat of the most severe punishment, a professional thief must never inform squeal on his or her fellows. Sutherland and Conwell view professional theft as an occupation with much the same internal organization as that characterizing such legitimate professions as advertising, teaching or police work. They conclude a person can be professional thief only if he is recognized and received as such by other professional thieves. Professional theft is a group way of life. One can get into the group and remain in it only by the consent of those previously in the group. Recognition as a professional thief by other professional thieves is the absolutely necessary, universal and definitive characteristic of the professional thief. Two types of professional crime Stooping Fencing Some experts have argued that Sutherland's view of the professional thief may be outdated because modern thieves often work alone, are not part of a criminal subculture and were not tutored early in their careers by other criminals. However, some recent research efforts show that the principles set down by Sutherland still have value for understanding the behavior of modern day professional criminals. Number 1 Stupors John Rosencranes found that one type of modern professional criminal Stupors organized their behavior according to the principles set down by Sutherland. Stupors are people who hang out at race tracks and recover winning tickets accidentally discarded by patrons. This behavior is a violation of state criminal law pandering. Through in-depth interviews, Rosencranes found that modern-day stupors employed specialized skills, derived personal status and satisfaction from their professional skills while being contemptuous of amateurs, were informally organized, helped tutor noises in the field and developed an informal code of acceptable group behavior. These traits make them a group of professional criminals who continue to behave in the Sutherland manner. Number 2. Fencing Nowhere is the concept of professional theft better illustrated than in the crime of buying and reselling stolen merchandise or fencing. Professional fences play an important role in the thieves working world. They act as middlemen who purchase stolen merchandise ranging from diamonds to auto hubcups and then resell them to merchant merchants who market them to legitimate customers. The fences critical role in criminal transactions has long been appreciated. As early as 1795, Patrick Colquion stated in his book A Treatise on the Police of the Metropolis.
in contemplating the characters of all these different classes of delinquents that is thieves robbers cheats and swindlers there can be little hesitation in pronouncing the receivers to be the most mischievous of the whole in as much as without the aid they afford in purchasing and concealing every species of property stolen or fraudulently obtained thieves robbers and swindlers must quit the trade as unproductive and hazardous in the extreme nothing therefore can be more just than the old observation that if there were no receivers there would be no thieves deprive a thief of a safe and ready market for his goods and he is undone much of what is known about fencing comes from two in-depth studies of individual fences one being carl clocker's highly respected work the professional fence and the other by Darrell Stephens Meir defense clockers examined the life and times of one successful fence who used the alias Vincent Swaggy through 400 hours of listening to and observing Vincent clockers found that this highly professional criminal had developed techniques that made him almost immune to prosecution consequently during the course of a long and profitable career in crime vincent spent only 4 months in prison he stayed in business in part because of his sophisticated knowledge of the law of stolen property to convict someone of receiving stolen goods the prosecution must prove that the accused was in possession of the goods and knew that they had been stolen vincent had the skills to make sure that these elements could never be proven also helping vincent stay out of the law's grasp but the close working associations he maintained with society's upper classes including influential members of the justice system vincent helped them purchase items at low cost bargain prices he also helped authorities recover stolen goods and therefore remain in their good graces Clocker's work strongly suggests that fans customarily cheat their thief client clients and at the same time cooperate with the law. Sam Goodman, the fans studied by Darrell Stephen Smear, lives in a world similar to Vincent Swaggy's. He also purchased stolen goods from a wide variety of thieves and suppliers including burglars, drug addicts, shoplifters, dock workers and truck drivers. According to Sam, to be successful, a fence must meet the following conditions. Upfront cash. All these are cash transactions. Uh, so an adequate supply of ready cash must always be on hand knowledge of dealing learning the rules defense must be schooled in the knowledge of the trade developing a larceny sense learning to buy right at accept- acceptable prices being able to cover one's back and not get caught finding out how to make the right contacts knowing how to wheel and deal and create opportunities for profit connections with suppliers of stolen goods 
the successful fans is able to engage in long term relationships and suppliers of high value stolen goods who are relatively free of police interference the warehouse workers who pilfers is a better supplier than the narcotics addict who is more likely to be apprehended and talk to the police connections with buyers the successful fence must have continuing access to buyers of stolen merchandise who are inaccessible to the common thief complicity with law enforcers the fence must work out a relationship with law enforcement officials who invariably find out about the fence operations Stephens Bearer found that to stay in business the fence must either bribe officials with good deals on merchandise and cash payments or act as an informer who helps police recover particularly important merchandise and arrest thieves This later role of informer differentiates Stephiner's description of the fence role from that of clockers. Fencing seems to contain many of the elements of professional theft as described by Sutherland. Fences live by their wits, never engage in violence. depend on their skill in negotiating maintain community standing based on connections and power and share the sentiments and behaviors of their fellows the only divergence between sutherland's thief and the fence is the code of honor it seems likely that the fence is much more willing to cooperate with authorities than most other professional criminals thank you for listening